Hebrews 1. The Mandate Hebrews 1, 1 1-4 God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Hebrews 1, 1 1-4 It has been said of Hebrews that it is, first, quote, the least known of all the New Testament epistles, end quote, Second, it requires a knowledge of the five books of Moses, and this may impede knowledge of Hebrews for many. Third, the classical view of this epistle is that it was written to a congregation, and implicitly for others like it, which was in danger of returning to the synagogue and temple worship, Hebrews 2.1, 3.12, 5.13 and 14, etc. There is also the unending controversy about its authorship, more than a few of the greatest champions of the faith, including John Calvin, denied Paul's authorship. Badcock rightly spoke of a plural authorship, stating, quote, Except for the single conventional phrase, quote, And what shall I more say, for the time will fill me? 1132. The whole is written in the plural number until we come to the personal messages of the last chapter. So, though it is convenient to speak of the author, it would be more correct in regard to the main bulk of the epistle to speak of the authors. End quote. There was a crisis in the life of one church specifically, which was also a concern elsewhere. For Paul alone to have addressed this would weaken its force among those of Jewish origin. The letter was a summary statement by an apostolic fellowship, and, like the decision of the Council of Jerusalem, Acts 15, was thereby given added authority in the churches. The last chapter seems to convey the personal comments and greetings of Paul. Joseph A. McAuliffe has called my attention to the personal note in Hebrews 10.34 that echoes Paul. Hebrews is emphatic in declaring the absolute and sole sufficiency of Jesus Christ, and this again echoes the Pauline letters. In line with this is a fact which the Australian scholar Noel Weeks called attention to, quote, The stress of Hebrews is that the, quote, age to come, end quote, has already come with the coming of the Lord. The future age is not set over against the New Testament age. The, quote, future age, end quote, begins with the New Testament age. However, from the standpoint of Israel in the wilderness, that age was definitely in the future, end quote, Today, we see Christians longing for the rapture or for the millennium and forgetting that the cross and the resurrection are our victory, and we now have a task of applying that victory to every area of life and thought. Hebrews 1 2 speaks of, quote, these last days, end quote, because we are in history's last era, the application of Christ's victory. Hebrews 11 tells us of the Old Testament saints who fought but did not receive the promise, Jesus Christ, in their lifetime. 1139. We are now in the last and great shaking of the things which are, whereby the things which cannot be shaken may alone remain. 1226 following. We have received a kingdom, the new world order, quote, which cannot be removed, end quote. Therefore, we must with grace, quote, serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. 1228. Those who were planning to defect back to the synagogue are reminded that, quote, our God is a consuming fire. 1229. They are told of the pilgrimage of the Old Testament saints and their problems, sins and griefs. This was written while the temple was still standing in all its splendour and the churches were small groups meeting in homes. The writer, in 1323 following, is free in Italy and Timothy was just freed. 
This indicates a date before the Jewish-Roman War and the destruction of the Temple in AD 70. The victory of, quote, these last few days, end quote, is cited repeatedly in the Psalms, the Prophets and the New Testament. Some of these views are important as reminders to us that ours is this great victory. 1 John 5, 4, quote, And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Daniel 7.14 All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father, neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Matthew 11.27 And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth, Matthew 28, 18 He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. Luke 1, 32 The Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things into his hand. John three thirty five. For to this end Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be the Lord of the dead and living. Romans 14.9 For he hath put all things under his feet, but when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted which did put all things under him. 1 Corinthians 15.27 That in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Ephesians 1.10 Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Philippians 2.9-11 Martin J. Weingarten in The Future of the Kingdom and Prophecy and Fulfillment, 1955, gave us a detailed account of the realization of prophetic declarations in Jesus Christ. Calvin called attention to this stress on fulfillment by his arrangement of verses 1 to 2, thus, quote, God speak formerly by the prophets, now by the Son, then to the fathers, but now to us, then at various times, now as at the end of the times, end quote. In other words, there is a finality here. The implication as Hebrews develops its argument is clear. If Israel had simply remained on the Arabian side of the Red Sea, there would have been no promised land. Similarly, if we as Christians do not move on in terms of our salvation by Jesus Christ to occupy all things in his name, we remain in our own wilderness and without the fullness of victory. The age to come is ours now if we act in his name and power. It clearly will not be struggle-free, but neither will it be victory-free. Hebrews is a summons to victory. To miss this fact is to fail to understand Hebrews. Discouragement is real, but victory is certain. Hebrews 12.12 12 commands, as a result, quote, Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees, end quote. These are words to exhausted and discouraged pilgrims. A much sharper word would apply to those who refuse to march and want instead to be raptured out of the battle. What these verses which introduce Hebrews to us say is that the key to life and history is the incarnation of Jesus Christ. At the same time, the actual number of times that either the name Jesus or the title Christ is used is not many, although the meaning of Jesus Christ and his person and work is the central subject of Hebrews. Because Jesus Christ cannot be comprehended simply in the person of one who walked about Palestine, he is not so much referred to as presupposed as the centre of all things. Previously, God had spoken by, or rather, in the prophets, quote, 
in the prophets themselves as the vessels of divine inspiration. End quote. Now, in Jesus Christ, we have God the Son revealed. The worlds were created by the triune God, which means that God the Son not only made all things, but is also the designated, quote, heir of all things, end quote, verse 2. The focus is not on the person of Jesus of Nazareth, but on who he was, God the Son, the Maker, Sustainer, and Lord over all things. The implication is clear. Leave Christ, and you leave life. In verse 3, we are told five things about the incarnate Son. First, he is, quote, the brightness of God's glory, end quote. The word brightness is better rendered by some as effulgence. He is the expression or open manifestation of God's glory. We are told that the person of Jesus Christ was the focus of more than met the eye. Second, Jesus was the express image of God's person, that is, the substantial nature of God, the reality of God's being. Third, Jesus Christ upholds all things by the word of his power. He sustains all things, and all things move in terms of his decree. All things means all things in creation. The world was called into being by the triune God, and moment by moment it is totally sustained by God the Son, the heir of all things. Fourth, Jesus Christ by himself purged us of all our sins. He is our Redeemer. He made atonement for us. Fifth, Jesus is now at the right hand of God, seated or in session, because he is our ruler and our judge as well as our mediator. Verse 4 connects us to the next passage by its reference to angels. Jesus Christ, who before his incarnation was God the Son, quote, so much better than the angels, end quote, as by his redemptive work now gained, quote, a more excellent name than they, end quote. Verse 4. The angels are servants of the Most High, but Jesus Christ surpassed all angels, and certainly all men, in his work as God's servant. His was the greatest possible service. God's right hand, the place of intercession and of judgment, will be the place of Jesus Christ until all things are subdued unto him. 1 Corinthians 15, 27 following. He will continue as king when his work as intercessor and judge is ended. Verse 2 tells us that Jesus Christ is the, quote, appointed heir of all things, end quote. Paul in Romans 8, 17 tells us that we are, quote, joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer without him, that we may be also glorified together. End quote. Hebrews is a summons to make, quote, the age to come, end quote, Christ's kingdom in all its fullness. We are not handed a ticket to easy living with our salvation, but a summons to disciple all nations for Christ. Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Our goal is God's great Sabbath. In verses 1 and 2, we are told that God has spoken. We do have a revelation, and this revelation has its finality and perfect expression, Jesus Christ. Leon Morris rendered the phrase in verse 3 as, quote, the exact representation of his, God's, being, end quote, and the Revised Standard Version reads, quote, the very stamp of his nature, end quote. Barclay pointed out that the Jews of our Lord's day, quote, Divided all time into two ages, the present age and the age to come. End quote. The day of the Lord would divide the two ages. As against this, Hebrews sees that new age as having dawned with Jesus Christ. Thus, from the beginning, Hebrews declares unequivocally that Christ's work is done, and we must now conquer our Canaan in his name and power. Hebrews is a mandate for action. Much of this is set forth in typology by references to Old Testament history, but there is also much direct admonition. Verses 